Hi everyone, thanks for coming. So first thing I wanna do is just to slightly introduce why I'm qualified to talk about this or why I'm interested in this. So a little bit about myself is, you know, I was a graduate student for almost six years at University of Wyoming where I did six years of research. After that, I was a research scientist at UC Denver and so, you know, I've done a lot of research. That's what most of my, you know, career has been doing is doing scientific research. I'm going to tell you right now, this is a really fun talk for me because I've, I was looking over my CV. I've done roughly 40 different talks in my career. Every single one of those has been to a purely scientific crowd. You know, we're typically like, you know, other graduate students and PhDs. This has been a very hardcore science you know, field. I've actually never given a talk to what I would call as like a general audience or real people as I like to refer to you as, you know. Scientists, we kind of live in our own little fake bubble. And so this is, you know, a very different talk for me, but I'm hoping, you know, it'll be good. So title of my talk is Why Bacterial Stress Matters, but really why the importance of funding basic science. And so what I mean by funding basic science is the federal government or state governments, you know, funding this science. And so I want to start with, you know, why, why I chose the term bacterial stress. And so there was a Senator William Proxmere. And he had created this Golden Fleece Award. And so he gave this award to scientific you know, endeavors that he considered non-important or wasteful. And so you know, he would often try and find silly titles or things that he just couldn't understand as why they would be important to be funded. And so one of those he came up with was he awarded this to researchers trying to understand bacteria stress. There's a famous old video that I could not find, but he kind of goes off on this rant about why should we care about bacteria stress? Why, you know, I have stress, you have stress, we have to pay our bills, we have to pay taxes. You know, that's the kind of stress I care about. I don't care about bacteria being stressed. You know, bacteria, they're hungry, they're stressed, they're cold, everything's awful for them. Who cares if, you know, bacteria are stressed out? Well, this turns out to be one of the first places that science has a really big problem with. And that's what bacterial stress means in science compared to that. You know, so when we think of stress, what do we typically think of? Anxiety, you know, like that feeling, you know, overwhelming feeling of you must do things. Well, bacteria don't really have that problem. You know, bacteria don't have to pay bills. They don't have taxes. So, you know, they're not stressed out in that sense. So bacterial stress doesn't mean the same thing. And this is a huge issue in science where, you know, we think of one term as meaning something, but for the general audience, it doesn't. A big one I always talk about in my classes is hypothesis and theory. So, for example, Theory, you know, we use that in common language all the time. Let's say, you know, a mother sees her child, you know, with cookies all over his face, and the cookies are all missing. She might say, oh, I have a theory who ate the cookies. That's not incorrect at all. However, in science, we would, de de you know, deem that as a hypothesis, where those two words have great different meanings. Well, it's true here as well. Bacterial stress does not refer to the stress we're thinking about. And bacterial stress is often how bacteria react to hostile environments. This is really important to understand because many bacteria that have to deal with hostile environments are pathogens or bacteria that can infect us. Automatically, this starts to mean something to us. You know, hey, I just said this infects us. This can cause problems. Well, really why this is though, understanding these stress responses, so these bad environments, can cause the bacteria to become even more pathogenic or lead to antibiotic resistance, a term that hopefully most of you, you know, have heard and are afraid of. So, Bacterial stress is something very important to study, right? Understanding this bacterial stress is often how we've, you know, started to learn how bacteria cause harm, and this has led to important developments in new therapies and treatments for antibiotics, you know, resistance. So do I think that Senator, you know, Proxmi is against developing new antibiotics or, you know, wants people to be sick? No, he's just misinformed. Now, am I gonna call him ignorant or say it's his fault? No, it's not. It's science that has failed. You know, it's the scientists that have failed to communicate their research correctly. It's not Senator Proxy, you know. He's not the, you know, he, scientists are the ones receiving this funding. You know, we're getting the gift. So we need to do a better job of communicating, you know, what the science is and how it's important. So, because I doubt Senator Proxy is against, you know, people being healthy. And so why is there this misinformation? Well, the first thing is few people actually understand what science, or what science is or how science is done. You might have heard this term, the ivory tower, you know, where science is just done on this tower, you know, and kind of looks, looks you know, down upon everyone. Well, it kind of is really an ivory tower where it's this mystery. A lot of people don't understand how science is done or what's going on. And so that's what I'm going to focus a lot on is just trying to get you guys kind of up to speed there. So you can't understand why basic science is important without understanding a lot of this, the, you know, nuts and bolts of science. And so 
first thing I'm going to do right now is I just want to give you guys what a typical scientific talk would actually look like. And so this is based upon my own research. So my research was the polar organizing protein Z is very important for subcellular organization in Colobacter. And we can see here that wild type Colobacter, these three different effector proteins localize to the cell poles. Where we see if we do a genetic knockout of POP Z in Colobacter, these now proteins become punctate and they're no longer localized to the pole. It turns out pop Z is a disordered protein, and we can simply see right here this is true because of this 2D NMR, where we see the hydrogen spectrum on a structured protein is heat shock protein 90. There's many different hydrogen groups interacting with each other producing this profile. The 2D NMR of pop Z, though, all the hydrogen are on top of each other, and so this shows it's an intrinsically disordered protein. This has also been shown that pop Z directly interacts with eight different proteins. Using a co-localization assay in E. coli, we can show a candidate protein's diffuse, where, co where their co-expression leads to co-localization. This has been shown with eight different proteins out of a screen of 26 proteins. Okay, how many of you understood the importance for this in human health? Be honest. So what, how do you think this would benefit human health? So that's, that's a pretty good, you know, thought, and you've really thought deeply about this. So the question was, it causes, you know, the question, or the answer was that, you know, it causes stress on the proteins. And so that's a good idea, you know, and I'm glad, you know, you could interpret it. But for most, this was pretty much gibberish, right? That's how I've given that talk, I don't know, probably 25 times. And don't think I sped it up. I did not speed it up to be more confusing. That's how it comes out. And that's how scientists give talks. And so... This was how we got the government to give us some money for this talk. I'm not going to read it to you. You know, you can skim through it. But this says this project focuses on the molecular mechanisms, the control of the interactions between the polar organizing protein POP-Z, which forms a polymeric scaffold at the cell poles of Colobacter crescentis. What do you guys think Colobacter crescentis is? So see, you even missed it's a bacteria. And that's because of my fault, not yours. You know, it's not like anyone's missing stuff, but that's how poorly we do this. And if you want to see why taxpayers paid for this study to be done, that's what you get. So why was this actually funded? And you know what? I believe in my research as a graduate student. It actually has huge impacts to human health. So yeah, what is this? Why is this the way we do it? So instead, how it should be is P53, and this is a protein that's very important for cancer uh, regulation. And it's the most mutated protein in all of cancers. So over 50% of cancers, P53 is mutated. P53 is also an intrinsically disordered protein, so it's kind of like POPZ. So my hope would be that if we understand POPZ better, this could lead to us understanding P53 better and develop novel treatments for cancer, or at least understand you know, how cancer can progress. Now that makes a little bit more sense, right? Hopefully. Another place, though, is POPZ is found in pathogenic organisms. Again, I didn't even mention that. You know, Poorly, you know, that I meant... I, I did a poor job, you know, convening that. But pop is found in pathogenic organisms, so organisms that cause harm. There's never been an antibiotic that's been discovered to target polarity in bacteria. So pop z could be, you know, if we could figure out a way of inhibiting pop z, this could be some kind of new antibiotic. So this is the real reason why taxpayers, you know, gave us money. And I believe, you know, there was good reason to give us money to do this research. Both of these are pretty huge, and we've made some really good discoveries there that will progress, you know, our knowledge of cancer for P53. But that's not what I communicated. I've never given a talk where I included these. In our grant, we didn't write about that being that way. Really terrible way of doing it. And so, you know, it's not the public's fault that they don't understand, it's the scientist's fault. And so this disconnect, like I said, it's rare for an actual scientist to present their work in a setting like this. This is the first time I've ever done it, you know? So like one out of 40 of my talks has been doing it. I'm grateful for this opportunity to do this, but it's rare. So why don't scientists do this? Well, there's not much incentive, honestly. So, you know, scientists, they go to big conferences, and you want to go to the biggest, best conference you can and give your talk to the most famous scientists. There's not a lot of, you know, like, it wouldn't be considered good, you know, to give a talk like this. This isn't something that would be prestigious. And unfortunately, in science, there's a lot of prestige. You know, a lot of people care about the prestige. And so most talks, you know, most scientists give lots of talks. Like, don't think, you know, a lot of people think scientists are kind of, you know, antisocial. They just go hide in the lab and they never come out. No, we give talks all the time. So if any of you are ever planning on going to graduate school or farther things, don't think you're going to get by without giving talks. Now, it might be the other scientists, 
but you're going to give talks. And so lots of talks are given. It's just they're typically very specialized and not for the general public. A lot of the conferences I've gone to are very expensive. I don't think most people in this room are going to shell out like $1,000 to go to a scientific talk. And that's, again, horrible. You know, problem on science folks. Like, I, I, I hope I cannot, I cannot emphasize that fact enough, you know, that it's not the general public's fault. This is, you know, science is problem. So few actually understand how science is done. And so that's what I'm going to, you know, take this next really big part of the talk is just to explain how science is done. And so because you don't understand how science is done, this leads to even more misunderstanding. So how science is done? Well, it turns out the majority of science is actually done at universities. A lot of people often think, you know, science is done at corporations or, you know, places like that. Drug companies and, you know, other places, biotech companies make up a small fraction of all the science done. Most science is done at universities. Anyone want to venture a guess who does most of the science? Purdue. Sorry? Purdue. Purdue? Purdue. Oh, not specifically a university, but that's a, yeah, awesome. Purdue is a very good school. But who does most of science? Way to go, Chuck. So graduate students are who does, you know? A lot of people think it's the professors. Professors do almost no science, honestly. They're busy doing other things. But almost all of the work is done by students. And it's not always graduate students. In my lab at UW, we had like 10 undergraduates working in our lab. We had three graduate students and 10 undergrads. So work is being done by graduate students or undergraduates. So students are who do research. Almost all the funding for science at universities mostly come from federal and local government. So in Wyoming, we do get a lot actually from the state, but most of it comes from the federal government. That's where a big portion of science money comes from. And so where is that coming from? Well, you guys, taxpayers. You know, anyone that contributes, you know, money to the, is where this money's coming from. So again, this is where science does a bad job of justifying to their customers, essentially, of why they should be given this money. There's two major federal funding agencies. So the first is the National Institute of Health, or the NIH. And so this, all the science that goes through the NIH must be justified of having a direct link to human health. I'm going to focus a little bit less on the NIH, honestly, for this talk, because it's pretty, it's usually apparent, even except for you saw my grant proposal, which was not, you know, so that still could use some clarity. But the organization I'm going to talk more about is the NSF, the National Science Foundation. So this is a lot more of the basic science being done. And so I want to go over a little bit of the budget, though, you know, because people think that, you know, science is a huge part of the national budget. And so the NIH budget for 2018 was $39 billion. The NSF budget was $8 billion. So significantly less is dedicated to the basic research. The national budget is roughly $4.4 trillion. So that means roughly 0.8% of the national budget went to science. Roughly 0.1% of the national budget went to basic research. So I do hope with this point, you know, we're not spending a lot of our budget on science. Now we could get, you know, there's a whole other debate about, you know, should this be increased or not? And I'm not going to get into that, but I'm just saying, you know, a lot of people overthink how much money is being spent. And so when we think about it in the national budget, it's very little. If we even combine the two, it's roughly 1% of our budget goes to science. So this is the NIH, and so this is why I'm not going to cover the NIH. Briefly, their mission statement, the key words here is they're looking for the application of knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. So science from the NIH has to have a direct link to human health. So this is not the basic research I'm talking about for this talk. You know, this is like, I want to you know, cure cancer. Now, that would be a horrible grant and way too broad, but, you know, that's what you have to be trying to claim. And typically, we always joke, really, for the NIH, you're either trying to cure cancer or AIDS. Those are the two big things, you know, that you're going to hit. Or, you know, create a new antibiotic. You're going to do that for the NIH. NSF, though, that's where things get a little more creative. And so the NSF is really to promote the progress of science to advance national health, prosperity, and the welfare by supporting research and education in all fields of science. So this is where, you know, pretty much anything that couldn't be considered, you know, a lot of like geology or some science and some, even my own research, you know, my research started as being very basic where we didn't know there was a human impact. And then also it developed like, oh, there is a human impact. And we'll talk more about how that works in a little bit, but the NSF really, they don't want that human impact right away. They just want science for science. So how does someone get this sweet grant money? So to obtain money, one must write a grant. So, you know, you have to write a grant. 
These are typically 10 to 25 pages. Now, for undergraduates, that sounds terrible. It's actually, usually the limit is you want to put as much into one of these as possible. You know, a justification for a given project. These are extremely competitive. The funding rate is usually around 19% for an NSF grant. Now, that sounds pretty good, right? One in five chance. It's not like a slot machine, though. It's not like, oh, you just throw one. I mean, it's only the top 19%. So all of these are written by PhDs, you know, people that have done very well in their career. And so these are very competitive. You know, only the top 19% of these get funded. And typically, you know, so a, typically a scientist would have to, you know, try, you know, five of them and one will get funded. And that's usually about the odds, you know. I think I wrote, I helped my boss write about six of them and we finally got one funded. These take forever to write. You know, often will take months. They're like mini, mini dissertations. You know, you spend hours upon hours writing them every day. So a lot of time is consumed. Remember when I said research professors don't do much research? This is what they do. They're writing grants. They're trying to get, you know, money for the lab. And so when someone gets this sweet money, what do they do with it? Well, right away the university takes some. It depends on the university. So the University of Wyoming is awesome. They don't take near as much. But right away, typically 10 to 40% of the grant is taken away. And that's for overhead costs. And so that's for you essentially to rent your lab space, to be able to have a lab space at the university. And that doesn't cover equipment. It doesn't cover machinery in the lab. If you want that kind of stuff, you need to buy that also out of the grants. It does cover like janitors, you know, electricity, all that. But right away, a huge portion of it goes to overhead costs. After this, the bulk of the money is used to pay for staff. So this is something weird. Graduate students get paid. A lot of people think, wait, why are they getting paid? That's stupid. You get paid to go to school? I had that told me so many times. Well, you're, you do a job. So a graduate student, they do studies. You know, they, do their, they go to classes. They do all of that. On top of that, they're expected to be in the lab 40 to 60 hours a week, usually tied towards the 60 hours a site. A typical graduate stipend is around $24,000 a year. So that's roughly $12 an hour. That sounds pretty good, right? You factor in when they're working 60 hours a week and they're not paid for the overtime because it's a salary position, most graduate students are making right around minimum wage. And you typically either have a master's degree or a bachelor's degree. So you're making minimum wage with an advanced degree. So don't think, you know, graduate students are making off, you know, super fat. They're not. The other problem is graduate students don't pay their tuition. The tuition is paid out of these grants. So that's another place where, you know, the boss has to pay for, you know, things with the grant money. So the school took their 20, their 10 to 40, then they're going to take the tuition because the graduate student has to be enrolled. So the university even gets a little bit more back. After the staff has been paid, that the rest of the money will be used for lab supplies. So this is a you know, combination of equipment. So let's say, you know, like in a molecular biology lab, you might need a fancy machine to look at DNA. Well, you got to buy that from your grant money. The school doesn't buy that for you. Or, you know, whatever equipment you would need. So everything there. Professors do not get rich off of grants. You know, they do not see a bunch of money coming from the grant. So don't think, you know, oh, a professor gets a $200,000 grant. Man, he just made out with some money. Not the case. Professors don't usually use it for their income. Now, I will be honest. There are some professors that they use it for their summer income. Because a lot of professors, at, you know, research professors at university, they don't get paid for over the summer. And so if they want to have a salary during the summer, they have to supplement a little bit there. There are very strict rules on how much they can supplement, though. So don't think professors are getting a bunch of money from this. And so I just wanted to give you guys what an average NSF grant. And so remember, only a 19% chance of getting this. Average NSF grant is $47,000 a year, and this lasts for 2.9 years. Take away that $24,000 for the graduate student, you're not left with a lot of money. You know, maybe another $7,000 for, you know, that little bit of summer money you're going to have. So typically, a professor needs multiple grants if he wants more than one graduate student. Remember that crappy funding rate? So that gets really tough. So that's where you know, professors spend so much time writing their grants. So what do, what do you guys get for this money? What do the taxpayers get for this money? Well, we get the knowledge learned from this. But how is this knowledge you know, given? You know, it's not like the professor just you know, has a blog or anything like that. Typically, what happens is it's in a scientific publication. And so, you know, they're going to take this research and do a scientific publication. This is where there's a lot more misinformation about scientific publications. So one big thing is, you know, uh, Senator Proxmi would all the time say, 
you know, there was one publication and he would attach it to the grant and then he'd always, of course, say for the grant's full years. So, you know, like let's say with the NSF one, 47 over three years, so that'd roughly be $150,000. He would always claim, oh, we paid $150,000 for this publication. That's horribly incorrect. Rarely does one grant get one publication. If it did, that person's career is gonna be over at the end of that grant. If you only got one publication from a grant, you would, your career would be over. Usually what you're going to get is multiple publications. So please, you know, if you see that, oh, you know, this study cost the US government $200,000. Well, probably that grant, you know, actually got six or seven publications. So, you know, it spreads the cost greatly there. So what is a scientific publication? So what do you guys think of, when I say scientific publication, what, what comes to mind? The research that they published. For yeah. Their... So when, I, when you say published, what do you mean by it was published? Um, it had to go through the specs and whatever to the editor and send to the system. Whatever yeah, they so great. So what he said was, you know, it has to go through a system. And yes, there is a very specialized system that publications have to go through in order to become published. A lot of people think though this process isn't that difficult, but it is. The first thing though is these publications, this is what makes or breaks a scientist. Really, you barely care about another, if, when, the first thing you do when you meet another scientist, or you know, like say someone's gonna come give a talk, you look up what their publications are. That's who they are. Scientists are their publications. It's an unfortunate fact, but you know, that's what really defines you. And it's like your currency. And you want the best quality publications you can get. And so when you try and publish a publication, there's multiple journals you can publish in. And so you want to publish in the most prestigious ones. There's three that are really important, Cell, Science, and Nature. I know it's weird, one of the you know, ones are called Science. Really weird when people say, oh, I published in Science. It's like, wait, you published your Science in Science? That doesn't make sense. But that's one of the top journals. And so everyone's always trying to get into the best journal you can, because that makes you better if you can. And so this is really important though. That's what makes, you know, so your number of publications where you've published them are what really make a scientist. Many schools are what are called publish or perish. So I made that comment, you know, that if you only publish one paper after you know, your entire grant, your career would probably be over. This is something that scientists have to live with is they have to be routinely publishing all the time. If they're not, their career, you know, they probably won't get tenure or they'll be asked to leave their university. So, you know, it's often a publish or perish thing. Now that's less true at you know, generally community colleges like here where you know, we have this heavy emphasis on teaching, but it's really important for you know, them to publish. So again, like I said, professors can often lose their jobs. Publications go through the peer review process. So that was the system you were talking about. That sounds nice, right? The peer review process. That sounds good, you know? Your peers are gonna review you. Well, here's a little fun joke that most scientists regard the new streamlined peer review process as being much better than the old one. I mean, if, well, I don't know when I got my publication, if all they would do is just beat me up, cool. I'd even take a few broken bones to get published over what I had to do. And so the peer review process is not by your peers. So it's three people they select. Two of them are usually experts in your field. And then they do this really nifty thing. The third one is always someone that hates you. I don't know how they do it, but they find this third person that hates you. And so this person is going to, you know, trash your science. And so how the peer review process works is you submit your paper to a journal, and that journal most of the time is just gonna say, nope, it's not good enough for it. We reject you right away. That's what typically is gonna happen. Is they're just gonna say, nope, you're not good enough. Throw your paper out right away. So that's pretty disheartening. If you get through that, some, the editor, then they go out and they find these three people, two of them which are decent and the one horrible person, and then they're going to, you know, analyze your science. And so, sorry, I didn't mean to click. They're gonna analyze your science. They're gonna determine if it's worthy. What they're gonna do is they're gonna suggest you do a bunch more experiments, and then you're gonna to have to do those experiments. With my first publication, it took one year after we submitted to get it actually published, because I had to do this four times. I had to constantly do new experiments, which cost more and more money, just to appease these people. And so do not think the peer review process is easy. Like, just don't think it's something you get to select your friends to do. You don't get to select these people. They're randomly chosen. And so the peer review process is very strict. And so this only enables the best science to get through. And if somehow bad science does end up, publications aren't permanent. You know, like we hear about sometimes bad science and roughly 0.1% of all papers do end up getting retracted. 
This is sometimes because, you know, accidents, or this could be because of, you know, false research. False research is very rare, though. So please, I hope you guys understand, publications are very sound. You know, like they're very, they've gone through this rig rigid process. So publication money and trust issues. How much money do you, and if you know the answer, please don't blurt this out. How much money do you think a research professor makes for publishing? Like average. Yeah, for a pu for a single publication. So fifty to sixty thousand. Anyone want to venture any other guesses? They don't know the answer. It's even less than nothing. They have to pay to be published. So it's it can be as cheap as five hundred dollars, and I say as cheap, or my publication costs two thousand dollars. So we had to pay out of our government money again to get published. It can be up to ten thousand dollars. The scientist makes zero out of my paper, which has been cited many times. You know, I think it was even in a it was in a journal. You know, it was like on national media a couple times. I've got nothing. I never will get a cent from that. I actually give up all rights to that when I have it published. It's not even my paper now. If I want to, if I want to like write another publication based on that, I have to cite it, or I would be known as self-plagiarizing. Mm -hmm. So I don't even own it anymore. So don't think scientists are getting rich by publishing. We're actually getting slightly poorer. We have to use our government money again. So this leads into trust issues, though, because a lot of people. How often do you guys hear studies say you know something, you know, for a dietary is the new thing you're supposed to do? You guys see that all the time, right? This is a huge issue, and it's not, this is between scientists and journalists. So another little joke. So scientist says, we destroyed 10% of the cancer cells in a lab rat's tail. Journalists, cancer's cured. Scientist tries to correct him. No, we didn't cure cancer. We're just moving faster towards a treatment. Time travel discovered. <laughs> it really is like this, though. Like, you know, it's a joke, but here's a, a real life example. So here's an article I found. New study says eating huge amounts of chocolate will lower your blood pressure. Awesome, right? Let's start eating chocolate, get lower blood pressure. I read this article. You know what they did not cite in here? The original paper this is based upon. They mentioned the researcher's name, that was it. Here's the scientific paper. So this says assessing you know, contributions of these flavanols, so that's the chemical in chocolate that will can lower your blood pressure. Keyword can, not always, and it only does it slightly. So that's what the actual paper says. The science is correct. The problem is it was miscommunicated by journalists. So, you know, a lot of people get their science from social media. And that's not bad. Please, you know, get science from all the sources you can. Just be a little bit skeptical about it. But don't automatically say, oh, you know, I don't trust science because I constantly see things wrong. Realize it might be journalists, you know, because would that make a catchy, you know, journalist uh, article? Mm -hmm. Probably not, but that first one was kind of enticing, right? Huge amounts of, I mean, huge. <laughs> you know, and so just realize, you know, a lot of times these get embellished. There's a major issue though. Let's say you go home and you want to find this article. You're not going to be able to. You, you will find this. If you want that full article, it's probably going to cost you 50 bucks. Uh -huh. So these publications, not only do they charge the scientists, they're going to charge you guys as well. There are some that are open access, but not a lot of them. So it is going to be something you'll probably have to pay for. You know? So even the scientific articles you guys can't find. Luckily, this school is really awesome. You guys have access to a ton of journals at the library. So if you go to the library, you can print off tons of scientific articles. And they have a pretty wide variety. So you know, there is ways you could access it and look at the primary literature. Again, though, sometimes the primary literature, and so that's what we refer to as a publication, is sometimes you know, not written correctly for taxpayers. And that's where there really should be a section like, hey, common sense why this should be funded. That should be like up here. That should be the first thing, but it's not. So what else do we get for our money though? So what else are you guys getting for your money? Well, I'm gonna be honest. Rarely does the work directly lead to new drug therapies. Universities are not great at making products, you know? So University of Wyoming is not gonna make probably a new pill for anyone. What's gonna happen though, it's gonna be picked up by like say a company like Pfizer or someone else, and they're going to try and make a drug off of it. So indirectly, this will be led to probably therapies. A lot of like cholesterol medications at BYU when I was there, you know, well not a lot, but one you know, new cholesterol medication at BYU when I was there was actually made and developed you know, by Pfizer. So a lot of times these do lead to direct products being made. So federally funded science actually has a huge ROI. 
I didn't really know what a return on investment was, honestly, but I had looked into it. And so this is how much you know, dollars you put into it, how much dollars are going to be gotten out of it. So the ROI of science is 30 to 100%. If you're not familiar with ROI means, here's a couple examples. An average stock gives 5%. Real estate, which is always considered a pretty gold standard, is 10%. Federally funded science is decimating that. Three to 10 times more, way better. So we typically get, now I'm not gonna tell you every single one gives this kind of return. You know, certain things give a really good return and certain ones don't. And so I wanna talk about a few examples of this. So a big one, the Apollo space program. Now we can see it after the fact, you know, being, you know, that 2020 hindsight vision, you know, is perfect. But when we first wanted to go to space, other than to beat the Russians, could anyone see a good reason for healthcare with that? Honestly, no, right? But has you know the space program revolutionized you know our society and human health? Yes. You know, a big thing was the microchip was developed. That was huge. That has revolutionized you know how medicine is done, how all, everything is. You know, all sorts of new plastics and materials. So the space program was a huge one. The human genome project. So that's been something done in a few of our lifetimes here. And so this was a goal of just simply sequencing the entire genome of a person. Now, we can see a good reason for that now, right? Like, oh, yeah, that's definitely. And I mean, this, the government funded a lot of money into this. At the time, though, we didn't really understand cancer as well or like genetic disorders quite as well. And so we didn't see the importance of knowing the entire genome to understand, you know, why this would be so important. But these paid off huge, huge. Like these are probably that return of investment is over the 100 percent. These ones are massive basic science that was funded, you know, this would have been considered NSF money. Just a few more examples. So antibiotics, has anyone not taken an antibiotic in this room? So they're pretty good, right? Like probably saved, you know, 50% of our lives or, you know, at least made our life a lot better by having antibiotics. Well, a lot of people have heard the story of antibiotics, but it was actually this uh, guy originally named Alexander Fleming. He stumbled upon using them using Staphylococcus. So a simple little bacteria. He actually did this a very funny way. He was a very messy lab person. And he had contaminated one of his culture plates with some kind of fungus. Turned out this fungus was able to inhibit the bacteria from growing. And eventually more people, don't think you know, he's the only person, but he was the initial discovery of this, were able to realize, hey, wait, this has antibiotic you know, properties. And boom, that's eventually how antibiotics led. He did not write grant proposals for, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to revolutionize the world by having this new, you know, drug that will kill off bacteria. No, he was just doing really boring work with Staphylococcus. It was basic research, but serendipity led him to very good, you know, work. DNA. So initially, you know, this, and this goes back a couple hundred years, but initially this uh, gentleman, Frederick Meischer, was just studying the composition of white blood cells. He was just studying the cells to study cells. You know, he wasn't setting out to revolutionize, you know, the molecular biology, but he noticed this weird protein and he dubbed it nucleon. And it noticed, hey, wait, there's this weird thing, nucleon, and it does something. And he led what was the start of understanding DNA, which, I mean, I don't think I have to state, you know, why, why it's so important to understand, you know, DNA for everything in our life now. A more modern discovery that maybe someone has heard of, has anyone heard of CRISPR-Cas9? Has anyone heard of genome editing? Okay, so there's been this new, and this is very, very new, within like 10 years or so. There's been this really uh, awesome discovery of that we can take this CRISPR-Cas9 system and we can actually go through and edit a genome. So we can go through and change the DNA of an organism. We, it's very little has been done in humans, but there's been trials of doing this in rats, you know, where we can give rats genetic diseases and then we can see if we can fix it. And with this um, tool, we're able to start being able to fix this. This can also, you know, because cancer is just really mutations, this is a major hope that, you know, we could go through and maybe edit out cancer. You know, don't try and kill the cells anymore. Let's go through and see, hey, can we fix it so they're no longer cancerous? And this tool will be super important. Trust me, in the next 20 years, CRISPR-Cas9, none of you guys knew about it yet? Everyone's gonna know about it or they're gonna know about what the next thing is, you know, it was built upon it. It's, this might not be the final form, but it definitely will be something. CRISPR-Cas9 is like the ultimate of basic science, though. This was initially described by this Francisco Mahoe, who was studying archaea that lived in salt marshes. 
So archaea are a very strange life form. They're not a bacteria. They're not a eukaryotic organism. You know, there's this weird in between. They don't cause human path. They, they never cause, well, not never. They rarely cause human infection. Archaea are pretty much harmless. You know, we have no interest. They're not really good for making biofuels. There's no human impact. And definitely, I don't care about salt marshes. Does anyone here care about salt marshes, you know, overly for your health or well-being? Probably not. But probably one of the biggest discoveries that could revolutionize, you know, human health was discovered because someone just noticed something in this archaea. It turns out this archaea has this CRISPR-Cas9. We took it and then we realized, hey, this could be used as a tool. And then we started modifying it. But CRISPR-Cas9 originated from a very simple organism. So this was the ultimate form of basic science. And so really, I hope you know, I've given you guys a better understanding of what science is, how it's done, and just a few examples of basic science. This is only a few, too. Like, I honestly could have just sat here and listed these you know, for hours to you guys of examples of where accidental or basic science led to something huge being developed. A lot of you know, medical technologies have been like that. OK, and so with that, I just want to finish up. Does anyone have any questions at all? Like, you know, just anything curious, anything, please ask. So the question was, what do I do now? And so what I primarily do is I'm a, you know, I'm a biology and microbiology instructor here. I also, I do do a little bit of research and I'm developing a research. I just uh, came here in August. And so I'm gonna do a little bit of research because I feel like research is a really good place for learning. And why a lot of research should be funded is because it just is for training. But yeah, so I'm still doing research and I'm actually uh, very interested in looking at an organism called Vibrio cholera, which if you ever played the Oregon Trail, you're definitely familiar with. But you know, I'm interested in cholera because it is a human pathogen. And we actually, last semester, isolated it in the Green River that we found. You know, now, I don't want anyone getting scared like, oh, the Green River is contaminated with cholera. It was, it's probably a very small amount, but there is some. And so I'm curious, hey, will, you know, where are we going to sample it year round and say, does it ever get up to a level that we should be worried about? So that's what I'm doing right now. Any other questions, comments? OK. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>